Welcome to another episode of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We've got another great show planned for you, as well as, of course, answering all those gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 1-800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers will be glad to help you. You can also submit emails and pictures for a future show. That's byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live. Give us as much information as you can about your issue, please. Do not forget to follow us on Facebook. Check out our video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. So, Wayne, that is not a pretty asparagus. <clears throat> no, it is not. So I was out in our Growing Together Nebraska garden this morning, and I stumbled across our asparagus not looking so great. And we have asparagus beetles on here. The adults are responsible for all the feeding damage on the sample. So we can get it on camera here. It does not look pretty once they get that up there. There's even a beetle crawling around on it right now. There, there we go. We go. So it doesn't look as it should. We've got the beetle right here, so this is an adult. All these feeding pits through here and this gnarly looking top are from the adult feeding. And then all these little black spots along the spear here are the eggs. Now, when the eggs hatch, the larvae will feed on the asparagus. Uh, easiest thing to do right now is prune out what's got the eggs on it and you can really knock down the population. There is another type of asparagus beetle called the spotted asparagus beetle, but that one, they actually lay the eggs in the berries and the larvae eat inside the berries, so you don't end up with any real damage to those. Um, these can get a little out of hand, so keep a close watch on it and pick up accordingly. And don't eat that. Maybe a little extra protein. <laughs> All right, Dennis. Hi. Bring him Hi. out. <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> Lauren, no, you do not like snakes. It's time of year for all snakes and most like garter snakes. This is a got to be a big one. Too. Common garter snake. It's a female, <laughs> average size female. So we have the common, the plains, and the ribbon garter snakes all found in the state of Nebraska. And they can be almost any color. This one has a little red, but that doesn't mean it's not a different species, it's all the scale count. But this is a time of year, let's see if I can get it to hold still. This is a time of year that they're mating. And garter snakes, uh, especially like a lot of different snakes, they like to have mating balls. It helps with their genetic exchange and diversity. And so one female will give off a pheromone and about 30 males will be all over her so that she can mate and that'll allow for genetic diversity. She'll actually have young that'll have um, oh, maybe three or four are fathers, and that's really great for um, these animals. So you'll see those big bunches, but those big bunches are a good thing because when they, once all these little baby garter snakes grow, they'll either be food for something or they'll eat a lot of insects and worms. And they're pretty much benign. They don't have any germs or viruses that we can get. We've tested them, and we're not even finding salmonella on those in the wild. So, um, again... Enjoy them. Yeah, there you go. Lauren? Uh, it's, it's all right. <laughs> is, that a, is that a female? Or do we have to worry about a bunch of males coming in here now, Dennis? Yes, is this that, is a female. Oh, that's great. Yeah, to open the door, let the female males yeah, in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone sees me screaming and running, it means I saw a snake you want, ball. You want, you want a drink? <laughs> Oh, brother. <laughs> that was not chewing on your finger like it did a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lauren, what did you bring? I really if you can have speak. no idea at this point. <laughs> anyway, no. Um, yeah, I have a... Got the knot? Yeah. Uh, I brought along a ground cover tonight that actually a friend of mine has, uh, Pachysandra, and it's uh, here in front of me, and it has Voluntella blight. Now, I sent a picture. I don't know if they have that or not of the, the yard with it. Um, not sure, if they don't show it, that's okay, but we'll yeah. show the leaf lesion. So this is a fungal disease that this ground cover is infected by, and you can see here, yeah, there's the picture. So you see how thin the stand is, and mm -hmm. um, a lot of, you know, a lot of obvious disease. It's favored by stress conditions, so, you know, drier conditions, uh, you know, if it's on a roadside and you had uh, some, you know, winter salt, these types of things would cause more of it. Um, the reason it gets so thin like this is it actually has lesions like we can see on the stem here that kill the individual stem. So if we flip to this live picture, if it's possible, you can kind of see this stem. It's got a real dark area here and then the rest dies. And so that's how you get the whole patch thinning out and dying. 
Uh, and in this, this particular case, it's pretty much killing out the whole uh, planting of it. Uh, so a few things to do if you experience this. Um, you can, you know, try to not overhead irrigate as much. Uh, moisture will favor it that way. Um, there are fungicide sprays you can use, but probably the better option would be to renovate the bed and maybe go to a different type of ground cover. Um, Kim, you mentioned one that's more common that's variegated. What's the name of that Allegheny one? is Allegheny, actually a different one. Uh, mm -hmm. Allegheny uh, Pacasandra is not as uh, susceptible to this disease as this one. So anyway, All right. All just right. another one you might run into. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Good habitat for the snake. I'm just kind of glad to see it thin out. There's not as much habitat <laughs> for the snake in the yard. All right, John. <laughs> John, what Still did you works. bring? I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, I decided to color coordinate with my with my shirt here. So this uh, is a very interesting tree. I, I snagged this from the, the Arboretum here on campus. This is a horse chestnut. Uh, and it's a cultivar called O'Neill's Red uh, because usually they're white flowers. This one has this really interesting pink flower. Uh, I just think they're an interesting uh, tree. They're related uh, to buckeyes. Uh, people confuse them with chestnuts, uh, but the nut is toxic, so you can't eat it. Uh, and it makes it just like a buckeye. It's another worthless nut, right? Uh, as well. Being from an area close to Ohio, we make those those jokes every once in a while about Buckeyes, right? Um, uh, it's an interesting tree for the landscape. Um, uh, sorry for any Ohio viewers out there. Right? Um, 50 to 75 feet tall, uh, mm -hmm. so it can be an interesting uh, landscape plant as well. And this this really uh, this pink one was all the the flowers were all over the tree. It's a very attractive tree. Mm -hmm. Beautiful big leaves and yes, excellent tree. All right, thanks. First ones are for you, Wayne. Uh, two, two pictures on this. This is a Lincoln viewer with radishes and something is eating the radishes. They have a couple pictures and they thought maybe an insect had a picture also of the uh, insect that might be nibbling on it and they're wondering what they can do to prevent it. So <coughs> it looks like that's on the uh, root and I think we, yep, and there we there have it. There it is. Yep. All right, so that is a pill bug or an isopod uh, and they do occasionally get into our vegetables that are in contact with the ground. Um, not much you can do about it other than harvest and maybe cut out the affected spots. They do tend to favor moist organic soils. They do reproduce very well in there. That's their habitat and they're actually crustaceans. Okay. So lighten up on the watering. You may be watering too much um, in that case and that might help. All decrease right. the problems. And you have uh, one picture on this next one. This is a six-year-old gardener and she was fascinated by these and she does think they're roly-polies. She made a habitat for them. She's, she's wondering and it was in a little jar. She wonders is she right and what do they eat? Well I, I guess I already answered part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. They eat organic material in the soil and so if you've got a bag of potting soil that put a little in your habitat. All right. Be happy. All right. One more picture for you on this round. Uh, this is a uh, Gothenburg viewer. The spider was hanging out in a corner of the walkout by the patio doors. What is it? And then the follow-up question is, do black widows live that far west? Well, that, <clears throat> I don't know. That's a whole can of spiders. I'm not sure we want to open up. But this is a Parsons spider. Mm -hmm. You can tell by looking at the abdomen, it has a silver... Uh, almost looks like a cat if you squint at it right. Uh, the head sitting there with the ears coming out um, with that silvery white marking. So that's how you tell them. They have this all the way from the younger uh, stages to the mature adults. Does he have his tongue stuck out? Does the cat have its tongue stuck out when you're looking at it? No, it's its ears. That's its ears. Okay. It's its ears. Right, wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the black widows, uh, there there are three species. There's the southern the northern and the western black widow. And towards the western side of the state, we do see western black widows. So yes, they are around. Um, I have had a northern one brought into my office up in North Fork, so they are around. Um, just give them their space and it'll be fine. All right. Dennis, your first picture. This is a North Bend, Nebraska viewer. <clears throat> Excuse me. What is causing damage to the yard? She has previously had moles or voles leaving <coughs> small bumps, but nothing to this extent. Yeah. So if this was done after it was green, then it had to be raccoons or skunks to dig it up. 
But if this occurred after snow cover, say it, it started occurring in the fall, it could have been just maybe moles and uh, gophers upheaving it and then the snow got underneath it and brought it up. So it depends. If it looks like, came to look like that after the lawn was green, then it's raccoons or skunks looking for worms and insects. All right. Uh, your next picture, this is a Rembrandt, Iowa viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, wonders what is the digger of the hole and how to eradicate it. Okay, it's a woodchuck, most likely, being that size and that much dirt. Um, in Nebraska, you, can, you can't use any toxicants, but you can trap it. And the best way to do that is to use a trap with a, something over it and kind of pre-bait it with like cucumbers or zucchini. And then once you trap it, you can bring it to a proper authority to have it euthanized. You cannot translocate woodchucks, so you can't bring it to your neighbor or down the street and let it go. That's not legal. All right. One picture on this next one. Uh, this is a, an issue with ground squirrels digging or burrowing. She has tried rocks, aluminum foil, mothballs, expanding okay. foam. They just move the entrance a little further. Yeah. It's not a 13 line ground squirrel, so it could be a Franklin ground squirrel or something else. Maybe, I don't know if a woodchuck. First of all, remember, mothballs are not labeled for outdoor use. That's federally against regulation to put mothballs outside. They don't work on anything, but it's also federally illegal to use mothballs outdoors. The label says they're only to be used indoors. Okay, about <laughs> that IPM part. Um, I would use lava rock. I know it's not the best landscaping, but if you're not growing anything there, instead of using aluminum foil or something else, pack in about two foot wide by six inches deep of lava rock, something that an animal cannot easily dig in and cannot move. So lava rock works very well for that. All right, thank you, Dennis. Lauren, you have three pictures on this one. This is actually an Omaha viewer, and it's asparagus. <coughs> um, Phytophthora, she thinks, from extension. Copper-based fungicide, but she doesn't think it's labeled for Phytophthora in asparagus. What's the best way to treat it, and what specific products do you think she should use? Yeah, so a couple things on Phytophthora with asparagus. So that's something that's favored by situations where the soil is not well drained. So as, as far as management, the first thing you're going to want to do is see if there's anything you can do to help improve soil drainage. If it's in an area, I couldn't tell from the photos, but if it's where water would pool, for example, if you can create some sort of drainage to make sure it's drained well. Um, avoid anything that's stressing it, and then, then higher pHs can also influence uh, this and make it more severe. So I, I would look at you know what your soil conditions are, do a test, make sure you have drainage. Uh, there, there are products that are, are fossatil aluminum uh, that are labeled, but these are these are very expensive, and I would really I, I would, it would be hard to want to manage that, I think, in your backyard garden with them, but you can look at that. So it's fossatile aluminum that you can look that, that there are some products out there. Uh, but again, it's going to be very expensive, and I, I would try to take the approach of drainage and, and, and other ways to manage it. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is Springfield. Two dozen rhubarb plants, 20 years ago transplanted. They add compost. One plant is showing these yellow-colored spots. So, yeah, so yeah. a couple things on this. I, I really couldn't tell from the photo exactly what it is. Um, and, and I would tend to just watch it. There are some leaf diseases of rhubarb that can become, you know, m more prevalent and, and thin the stand. If you just have a little bit of it, though, I would watch it. If it looks like it's expanding, try to avoid any overhead irrigation if you have it in the garden setting. But uh, overall, I think it should be fine. All right. Thank you, Lauren. All right, John, two pictures on this first one. This is an Omaha viewer. Uh, his only question on this apple tree, or I'm sorry, this is the uh, rhododendron. So this is Manhattan, Kansas, and she got this rhododendron last spring, planted it northwest side of the house, dry leaves, but she's also seeing some green leaves at the base. She's wondering, is this going to come back? 
Yeah, so with uh, the old leaves being brown and some newer green leaves coming out, I'm leaning toward probably winter damage. Uh, we get this on a lot of our plants that retain their leaves through the winter uh, in our area because it has just been so dry in the winter and it dries things out. And, you know, there could be some, you know, some temperature things, but it's mostly ju the dryness and desiccating during winter. Uh, and also things like rhododendrons and azaleas, they struggle in our area because usually the soil pH is too high. And it, you know, rhododendrons and azaleas, they like soil pH is around like 5.5 and we're just <laughs> nowhere near that. So. You know, it's already sort of set up for failure. So I would just, you know, make sure to water it, especially in the fall uh, and anytime the ground is is thawed in the winter uh, to try to avoid some of that winter damage and, and get it through. All right, uh, three pictures on this next one. This is a wisteria over the pergola, bloomed for the first time. They were thrilled, but they had dark centers now in some of the ones that they cut back. Disease, we think not, probably just it's rhododendron, or it's uh, wisteria, right? Yeah, I mean, wisteria, you know, they're, they, they grow, you know, kind of slowly, they produce slowly. We can get a lot of winter damage in them as well, because um, I don't think of anything that, you know, with those dark centers that, that would cause that. So I think it's just wisteria being wisteria. <laughs> All right, one more picture, and this is a Walton viewer, a little tiny oak. Something took the top out of it, and he wonders if he can retrain this to a new leader. You know, this is not an ideal situation. We, you know, we, whenever we lose the leader of the tree, we, we have some unusual growth patterns. But since it's so young, uh, you can select one of those, those branches to sort of train it upward. Uh, what you want to do is to, to make sure that you, you know, get it a good start, get it trained upwards, maybe prune out some of those other ones so that you don't have competition and get you a, an upward leader started in that tree. But it is possible, especially since it is so young. All right. Thank you, John. Well, we are going to take a look at suffrutescent plants tonight. They might look like a woody shrub, but they really aren't. And what you might think is damage from winter killer drought might be something else altogether. We recently took a walk around East Campus to check out the condition of our suffrutescent plants. We get a lot of questions this time of year about plants that look like they're dead over the winter and of course there are a lot of plants that did die or at least died back a long ways. But there's a big difference between plants that got winter kill and plants that are what we call suffrutescent. Sounds like a big word, what that really means is you have a woody base and a semi-woody top. And in winters where conditions are really severe, whether it's drought, wind, all sorts of things like that, we can have all those suffrutescent plants simply fail to leaf out. Beautyberry is a classic example. This is one that has been used extensively because people love the size, they love that sort of amethyst colored fruits. This is one called Pearl Glam. Last year it was gorgeous. This year we have two little shoots from the base. So the issue really with the suffrutescent plants is you have to understand when you get them they're not really a woody shrub. So we're gonna take a look at a couple of other examples and talk about what you need to do if you wanna use these in your landscape. A couple issues associated with suffrutescent plants are the cultivar variety and when you plant them. Oftentimes fall planting really becomes an issue if we have those weird winters. And cultivars, even though they're chosen for beautiful things like purple foliage, may not be very well tested in our up and down climate. That pearl glam, as an example, that is supposed to come out of the ground with purple foliage. You might have noticed that that is bright green. That is no longer the pearl glam. This is blue mist spirea. This is another classic. It blooms in August. It's beautiful. You'll notice we have a little bit of live foliage on the very top. We have a lot of pruning cuts here, and we have a lot of dead blue mist spirea. So again, the same issue is that what is the cultivar? When was this planted? The top is semi-woody, the bottom is not. Roses kind of fall into the same category, but of course people who grow roses do understand that the top of a rose bush is really not supposed to live through the winter in most instances anyway. Butterfly bush is another classic suffrutescent plant, and this is a really old stand of butterfly bush. You'll notice we have some that have a lot of foliage from the base. They look pretty robust. Others are mostly twig. 
The good thing about most suffrutescent plants is they flower on what we call new wood. So as long as they are alive now, you are likely to still have the beautiful flowers later in the season. People love Wygelia, especially the newer ones, which are smaller, they bloom longer, they might have variegated foliage, and they do this. This is classic Wygelia, wants to be suffrutescent. You'll notice the whole top on this one might have a little bit of green left, but not enough to make any difference. And they are beginning to try to flower on some of the wood. So here's the deal on suffrutescent plants. Make sure you understand that what you're buying is not a shrub that you can expect to slowly get bigger, slowly stay well through the winter, give you that contribution for years and years and years without occasionally deciding that that non-woody top does not want to live through the winter. <coughs> Suffertestants can really add a lot of that color and texture, but you have to remember those are not really shrubs and they need a lot of attention. All right, Wayne, uh, you have two moth pictures on this first one, and this comes from McCook, Southwest Nebraska. So cute and so very busy, says the uh, viewer. What is this one? It's a white line sphinx moth. Very common sphinx moth uh, or hawk moth. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they are day active, typically in late afternoon, early evening. All right, and then you have one more picture from a Lincoln viewer, and uh, this is a moth that was on the north-facing windowsill inside the garage. It was deceased. It probably beat itself to death against the window, unfortunately, oh. but it's the same thing. It's a white line sphinx moth. All right, same thing. Excellent, thank you. All right, Dennis, your first picture here. Oh, one more for, one more for Wayne, sorry. Oh, this is a grub. How could I forget the grub? I probably did that on purpose. So this is a viewer who was uh, planting the garden, digging these up everywhere. He wants to know what to use in the garden to get rid of them, or does he need to? Well, my, my suspicion is that they watered their garden last year, and a lot of things moved from unwatered areas into watered areas with the drought. And unfortunately, at this point, they're gonna be pupating soon, so there's not much you can really do. Um, I'll let them be and hope they don't get into the potatoes or pick and dig. They can pick and dig, but you gotta dig to pick them. <laughs> All right. All right, now, Dennis, this is a Yankton viewer, uh, planted onion plants, and a couple days later, walking in the garden, most of the plants were pulled out of the ground. The green end was still in the soil. They replanted the next day, and they still got pulled out. Yeah. <laughs> Thurston Lane ground squirrels are notorious for going down newly planted things, or when little tiny, you know, cotyledons are small, corn plants are just starting to come out, they'll go right down and pick them. So it's usually 13 line ground squirrels and, and they are in Yankton, so it's a good chance that's what it is. All right, uh, two picks on this next one. This comes to us from Holdridge. This is a viewer who planted, <clears throat> excuse me, seedlings uh, last May. Next morning they had all been dug out and, and uh, lying next to their holes, no visible, visible damage, replanted. Second time, he put wire cages around them and still varmint digging. What is doing this? And uh, he says this is beginning to, <laughs> to resemble an Elmer Fudd versus Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah, well, it <laughs> could be rabbits after the roots, but I don't, it, there's not much that, something wants to dig there for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it could be a squirrel that buried its nuts there, and then you put the tarp down and put something down. But it's a larger mammal. It's not a mole or a gopher. It's something like a squirrel or a rabbit that for some reason wants to dig in that location. And it, does, it looks a little deep for a rabbit, so it's more likely one of the squirrels or ground squirrels. All right, uh, one pick on this next one. <laughs> this is a Lincoln viewer. Um, last week, his wife said there was something buried in the raised bed. He dug and found a dead chicken, and he didn't know if the animal would come back. Obviously, he took the chicken to the garbage, but then he found something that had dug in the same spot. The yard is fenced. He wonders what would have jumped the fence and buried something in his raised bed. Weasels and minks can jump a fence or dig under a fence, and they love to bury their food and hide it. They kill more food than they'll eat, so likely either a weasel or a mink. In Lincoln. Hmm. They're around Lincoln, yep. Okay. Both of them are. 
All right, uh, Lauren, this is a viewer. Uh, two pictures on this one. This is Black Hill Spruce, planted them last year. Uh, and then he's got this black stuff going on. What, what do we think this is? Um, in, in this particular case, I, I really don't think we're dealing with the disease. If I, I couldn't get zoomed in enough, it, it, it could be there are some little uh, saprophytic fungi that just grow on the surfaces in little niches like that in the, in the, the little joint areas on this main stems. So it, it could just be that. I wouldn't worry about it as it being a disease, though. All right. Uh, two pictures on the next one, and this is a Malcolm viewer, also spruce. This is a blue spruce. The top died. Uh, looks like there was an opening and then there's sap, and obviously you can see that there. And so same sap out of another one close. What is this? Yeah, so uh, a, a lot of trees, uh, cankers are favored by drier conditions. So uh, particularly if, if, even if it's watered, um, the weather conditions we've had have been really conducive for cankers. So if it's possible to go down the tree, about three to four inches below the affected area and cut and still have a reasonably looking tree or one that you can retrain a leader in, um, that's what would be recommended there. It, okay. it, it will probably kill that part of the tree off that way. All right, thank you, Lauren. Okay, you have, uh, John, two pictures on this first one. This is a viewer in Kozad, and this is a, a big, what, Dracaena or something like that. Looks like a Dracaena. Yeah, and she, she said, you know, you can see the kind of the spot in the center, and then it's kind of doing this. She's wondering, is what, what does she do to save the thing? Yeah, I would try to zoom in to see if that, you know, it was like some sort of damage that killed the top or if it was just growing like that. So if it's just growing like that, if you wanted to sort of salvage the top and turn that into a new plant, uh, you can do a, a grafting method where you sort of slice into the stem uh, and you sort of uh, put something in there to, to give it a space and pack some like uh, moist peat uh, moss or sphagnum moss around it and wrap it up. Uh, and so you can do uh, sort of a, you know, starting uh, that way. I mean, these plants, you can see there's new growth coming from the base. So you can also just cut the top of it off and you're gonna have new plant coming out as well. So there's a few different ways that you can that you can do this. David. All right, uh, and one pick on this next one. This is uh, a viewer who's wondering if this one host is going to survive. It's in a row on the north side of the house. The ones on the other sides look normal. Yeah, so I think there's a few things going on with this. First off, there's rock mulch, uh, which we sort of recommend against rock mulch. It heats up a lot. Uh, so whenever the sun pops out, it heats up and it can cook plants. So we can have that going on. Uh, I also think there's a possibility that there's a viral disease with this. We have one called Hostavirus X, which is like... I don't know why we called it Hostavirus X, but uh, we have that and we get that crinkling. And, and Lauren, if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what does a virus look like in a plant? <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that looks a lot like what you see there. There are some uh, cultivars that look like that and have what we'd say rugose or rough leaves. But in that case, just some of the leaves are like that, John, and, and some of the newer leaves are, are, it's more pronounced than those. And that's a good indication of a viral infection. And so you want to get rid of it because mm -hmm. it will spread to all the other plants. So pop that one out and that can keep it from spreading to the other plants. Or if they just have one hosta. It was surrounded, it was surrounded by hostas. Well, then they need to get rid of it, yeah. And you gotta, really you gotta like listen, that, you it'll gotta spread listen. to all of them. You gotta and listen then to they the question. A lot of you, got, you gotta listen to the question. <laughs> I'm a pathologist, I wanna encourage you. <laughs> <questions. laughs> all right. Well, our garden is just about ready to be planted and all of the potted plants are out of the greenhouse hardening off. Terry James tells us more out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, as you can see, we have everything out of the greenhouse. The greenhouse is completely empty. Port Club had a fantastic sale and all of our plants are outside. They're hardening off and they're ready to get into the ground. So Thursday, if it's not raining here in Lincoln, is gonna be our first planting day. We're super excited about being able to design all of our beds for this year. We also have our raised beds getting filled and the one raised bed that we started our early cool crop plants in is really starting to come around. This warm weather is really helping those lettuces and radishes and stuff get up and going. We've had a little bit of rain here. We're hoping for a little bit more because we're super dry here in Lincoln. And our perennial beds, our rain chain are all looking really great for the summer. 
So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, of course, it is time for lightning. All right, John, are you ready? I was born ready, and I like my odds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. <laughs> Lincoln viewer. And uh, they had three Taylor junipers that bent over in an ice storm, the one ice storm we had, apparently. And now uh, she's seeing brown tops in them. Is Are they going to survive? So if the top of it is brown, it's not going to grow back. So probably it'll survive, but won't look look right. All right. Uh, this is an Underwood, Iowa viewer who has globe blue spruce on standard and they are getting a little bigger than he thought. Can they be pruned really hard or not? I wouldn't do hard pruning. You can do some light pruning, but if you prune out all the green part, you're not going to have anything left. All right. Uh, this is a viewer in West Point who had a little lime hydrangea and pulled the old mulch back, found all sorts of roots, covered them with compost. Was that the right thing to do? Uh, you might want to prune those out. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who wants to know whether you can use grass be gone in strawberry beds. Uh, I would have to look at the label, but I don't think most of those things are labeled for food crops. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wants to know whether anybody has seen Sweet Annie Artemisia around lately. She's having a hard time trying to find that plant. Uh, well, I haven't seen it, so there we go. Okay. All right. Nice job. Okay. Are you ready, Lauren? <laughs> I'm just... All I can think about is snake balls, so I just... <laughs> No. I'm gonna try. All right. <laughs> this is a this is a viewer uh, from Omaha, who uh, found sort of blue green algae and other things that looked pathological in their stock tank. Is this toxic, and how do you control it? Oh, uh, it's it's just uh, existing there from the water, and uh, there's some nutrient level in the water many times, and you get some algal growth. Um, you, depending on what's in it, you know, even. Uh, just, you know, cleaning it up real good can remove it. You know, bleach will many times be used to sterilize containers and things to get it out. All right. Uh, since it's been so dry. copper would also copper. help. Okay, that was not lightning. That Sorry. was heat lightning. All right. Uh, we have no uh, cedar apple rust in this part of the state. Does that mean it will be reduced next year? Um, it, there may be some less because if, if it's dry enough that we don't have the infection of the apple trees, Mm -hmm. And then they're not infected, you, in theory, wouldn't have as much infection of the juniper in the fall. So it is possible it will reduce some. All right. We have a viewer who wants to know whether her peaches should be treated for rust. Not usually. Not rust. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah uh, no. Other, other uh, foliar diseases can be scab is one on peach. Um, not, I usually don't see rust, at least on any of them. Clearly, we know how to make Lauren uh, totally lose his focus. I, I can't, yeah. All I can think of is snakes. It's like winning the lightning round is easy when yeah, the other contestants forget that they're uh, in the lightning uh, round. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dennis, Dennis, you are in the lightning uh, round. Right. Okay. Yes, I Good am. luck. Yeah. We have a viewer uh, who says that he has seen 30 plus squirrels all running around in his yard at the same time. His neighbors have seen the same thing. What is up with 30 plus squirrels running around? Well, squirrel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's mating season, second litter. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that was easy. This is a viewer who has uh, lilacs and has uh, old lilacs and has seen bark damage up 18 to 24 inches. Is that what, what critter might that be? Deer, maybe? <gasps> that would about be about it that high. All right. right this is a viewer who wants to know whether raccoon pee will kill her turf. Probably if it's always in one place and they do have latrines, so yes. So not spots all over the yard. Right. Okay. Well, spots where they pee, yeah. Right. Okay, this is a viewer who has uh, had vole holes in the flower beds. Are they still there or do voles move away in the spring? They don't move away, but they're very cyclic because you get high populations and small populations. All right. Uh, this is another squirrel viewer who said uh, she's seen squirrels jumping straight up and down on the trunk of a tree. What, what is that? Going. Probably territorial marking or doing some kind of territorial to other squirrels. All right. Okay, Wayne, you ready? Sure, I'm gonna go for beating Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a viewer <laughs> who, who also has lilacs and she cuts some to bring them into the house and then all of a sudden there are little red insects all over the house. What might those be? 
Little red insects, uh, they could be a mite that were that was on there. That would be about the only thing I could think of that would be on there. All right, um, this is a viewer who had 1 16th inch orange, yellow, tannish little insects in the water tank. Hundreds of them, he thought they were aphids. Is that a possibility? I'd, be, I'd like to know what water tank they were in if it was inside, outside. Outside. Could be a lot of things with that color combo. All right, we have an Oxford viewer who said they have an unusual number of moths in the house, how to prevent them or get rid of them. And they're big. Shades. Shades. Make sure your windows aren't wide open or doors wide open at night when the lights are shining out. All right. We have a Beatrice viewer who said she had at least 20 at one time in the house. Same answer? Same answer. Cats right. like to eat them too. <laughs> all right, this is a Gehring viewer who says she's had white flies all over in the garden or in pots. Already in the garden? Mm -hmm. Well, it's gonna be a rough year then if she's already had <laughs> white flies this early and that thick. Right. Um, they're tough to get rid of. Yeah. Um, a lot of hose washing to wipe, get those larvae off before they get settled down and in place. All right, nice job, all. Okay, plants of the week, John. Um, two that we're talking about and two that are just, or one that's just in there. What do we have tonight? So we have this uh, little beauty here. This is a columbine. This is our native columbine, uh, American columbine that recedes. It's short-lived like shade or part shade. Uh, so uh, just like uh, the garter snakes, it loves to spread its DNA around. So it will just pop up everywhere. Uh, and if you have other columbines, they will all cross. And it's uh, really interesting. It can be a little uh, fun little experiment to see all these columbines popping up in the garden. Uh, and then this uh, little uh, blue number here, a storm cloud Amsonia. It's uh, upright. Uh, I'm gonna try to pull it out there a little bit so you can see it. I have the wrong stem, that would help. Uh, so almost black buds before they open to these pale blue flowers. Uh, and that one is uh, full sun to part shade and uh, can take some uh, dry to average uh, soil moisture. So there Excellent. we go, plants of the week. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Wayne, uh, two, two pictures. They're kind of the same one. This is uh, Imperial Nebraska. This is a house plant. She's had it for three years this year in just a couple weeks. She's seen these, she's calling them snail-like things all over it. She takes them off, but the plant is losing its leaves. Yeah. Well, you're not taking them off fast enough mm. uh, if they are continually mal multiplying. Uh, an insecticidal soap will work on the crawlers before they get into the hard scale, and it's, you're gonna have to move pretty quick and wash them off to get them going. All right, uh, you have three pictures on this next one. This is a Lincoln viewer. These choke cherries were brought by a bird overnight. The new end growth on every single branch looked like this, and inside were these things. What are they and what to do? They're aphids. Um, there's gonna be some, a lot of other insects coming along to eat those pretty quick uh, if they're in that high of a population. If the ants are protecting them, then that won't quite happen so readily. Um, again, I like washing aphids off with hoses. A uh, nice strong blast of water works really well for that or an exotic soap if you're really trying to get after them. All right, thank you so much. Okay, Dennis, um, this is a viewer who saw these two beavers swimming upstream in one of the drainage lakes in central Nebraska, stayed this far apart, then one would dive and the other would continue on. After a while, there was only one. Are they a pair? I, I don't, to me, I was looking at it, they look like otters, river otters, not beavers to me. Mm. The way their head is and the way it's, it's light color under the neck and, and just there's the length of the body. I think they're river otters, which are great because they're coming back. Nice, yeah. all right. Um, this, uh, two pictures on this next one. This is a Siberian elm by the edge of a seawall. They had a ton of snow. This is what happened. Was this a beaver? Will it survive? Um, that's definitely a beaver, not a any very large else. rabbit. And will it survive? <laughs> I doubt it. Um, yeah. yeah, it's around the whole thing, and so I would say you lost your camdium and your xylem and phloem, so yeah, it's, it's done a for. Yeah. Okay, all right, Lauren, um, two pictures on this. This is a, no, or, I'm sorry, we have one more <laughs> for Dennis. This is a fun wow. one. What is this? Common snapping turtle, it's probably, if it was just taken recently, they're coming on, they leave the water to lay their eggs this time of year. All right, and you have yet one more. What's oh. this? That's a juvenile, yellow belly or North American racer. They're, they become full green when they become adults, but as juveniles, they're like this, and they're mainly insect eaters. 
Um, so it's a, they're found statewide. The racer is found statewide. Awesome. All right, now it's your turn, Lauren. So After this two, picture. <laughs> <laughs> two pictures on this one. Uh, this is a Council Bluffs viewer. Mushrooms cut down a tree a couple years ago, and these are growing like all get out. What are they, and what do you do? Well, and, and I would just enjoy them. They'll just be there for a little bit longer. They're decomposing the roots that are in the soil from, I think they said there was a tree removed in the note, mm -hmm. and um, that they, they will gradually go away, but there's nothing you can really do. You can't. They're going to have to just decompose that structure and, and, and go on. All right. Two pictures on this one. This is a Berthoud, <clears throat> Colorado viewer pasture, not irrigated. Whatever this is, it seems to kill all the turf. She does maybe think this is winter injury. Well, and if it, it came out of winter where it's in a, a large patch like that, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the turf is and such. If, if mm -hmm. depending on where it was, if there was snow, snow cover, you can have patches that are some snow molds that do that. Um, there are other, a lot of different types of turf diseases, so I'm, I, I can't say for sure without a sample on that one. All right, and two pictures on this one. This is a Blair, <clears throat> Nebraska viewer who says the grass tips are turning bright yellow. Seems to start at the tip and work down the blade. Any ideas? Well, um, Ascochyta leaf blight is one that we see in turf and, and with the dry conditions, uh, it's favored by drought. Uh, if it's a non-irrigated lawn or an area that maybe isn't get as, as much moisture, that would be what I'd suggest that is. I wouldn't treat it, just you know, try to manage it with good moisture. All right, uh, John, two pictures on this one. Uh, he, it's pretty simple. This is an apple in Omaha. He's wondering whether he should prune this or just let it go. So once it gets to that, that size, you know, it's a little hard to manage because you can't really prune more than a third of a tree at one time. So, you know, you could uh, try to, to trim it up a little bit because once you get to that size, you're going to have lower quality and lower size apples. Uh, but to really prune it like an apple tree should be, you know, you're never going to really get get to that point. So, you know, you can prune it up a little bit, but you're, you know, it's really gone too far. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more apple tree picture. This is fall of 21. Last year it had one apple, but then has this thing going on. Should uh, this be pruned out or staked up? So I would definitely uh, catch some pruning on this before it gets too much bigger. Pick one of those top branches for the leader, get rid of the other one, um, and you know, clean up around the base. So people mistakenly think you just go and buy an apple tree or a fruit tree and you plant it, uh, but you really should do a pruning cut when you plant it, which gives most people heart palpitations because you top the tree, uh, and that may not have happened here. So I would get rid of one of the leaders, uh, clean up, pick maybe three or four of those bottom branches, uh, and then do that again, you know, as that leader grows, it'll have some branches pop out and pick three or four a few feet up up uh, from that. Perfect. And you'll be good to go. All right, this is a Franklin viewer. They got hailed on terribly. And this is uh, the remains of her honeysuckle, all of her 60 year old trees, the vegetable garden, lots of perennials. All we can do is you know, you can clean it up and prune it out. You know, honeysuckle's pretty uh, a vivacious plant. It might come back. You can know, just prune out the damage and see what it'll do. It's not like a tree where if you lose the leader, you're kind of lost. You know, it'll just sort of grow back and see what happens. All right. If you don't like what grew, grows back, get rid of it. Okay, and then this is a four-year-old crimson maple shot up two long shoots. Shall these just be pruned off? Yeah, if, if they don't have leaves on them, I would go ahead and prune them out because it could have been some winter damage on those to kill them out. So right. prune those out. Okay, well, you know, having a diversity of plant material around your home is a really good way to go to avoid serious problems with those disease and insect pests. It's also a great way to experience new plants, make your surroundings beautiful. Todd Fowler from Fowler Landscapes talks about several varieties of fur you might try. With a lot of the disease and insect issues we're seeing on conifers, we're trying to find new options. Um, the best thing always is, is to diversify, so never go with one variety only. But one species and one genus here and there we, that we're trying to talk or look at are the abies, which are the true furs. And it's hard to get a lot of the fur varieties. The, it's bad enough trying to find just con color fur, the one we're used to. But today I'm going to show you some others that you may want to play with in your landscape or in the windbreak or, or just as a screen. Uh, the first one is Nordman fir. That one 
is maybe the most readily available of the seven or eight that we're playing with other than con color fur the nordman fur has very dark green waxy needles uh, has the perfect christmas tree shape in fact a lot of these fur do not that that's what we're after but they, they just have that pyramidal shape kind of like a spruce does uh, nordman fur are native to the caucasians or, the, or russia uh, one that is very similar is the turkish fur Abies born Mulleriana, and uh, that one is almost identical other than the needles radiate around the stems instead of flat like on the Nordman. So it's pretty hard to tell them apart other than when I look at the tag. That seems to be my easiest way. The silver fur is maybe my favorite of, of the new ones. Uh, I had a 20 footer until two winters ago. The, so it had gotten in the wide open spaces, it had gotten through the winters just fine. But that winter of 21, 22, where the wind blew all winter from December to April, did a number on a lot of conifers, including even ponderosa pine. And my, my silver fir died about three fourths of the way down, so we took it out. But it gave me the, the experience of knowing that it is possible. And if we don't put it in the wide open area, it'd probably do even a little bit better. The Canaan fir is one we're relatively familiar with. That one, and all fur in general, we don't want to put in heavy clay soils. Uh, they drown relatively easy, as do a lot of conifers for that matter. But the, the Canaan fir is a cross between the balsam and the Fraser. Uh, smells like a Christmas tree if you break the needles, so it's kind of uh, multi-purpose there. You can rub through them and they, they smell like Christmas. The King Boris fir is a, another fir similar to the Nordman and the Turkish, as is the Cilician fir. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with both of those. It's probably been about 20 years since I got a couple in to play with and uh, we sold them so I didn't get a, to plant them myself. But uh, I like to have personal experience with them. And then finally the Korean fir. It's called the garden conifer. It doesn't get quite as large. It grows a little bit slower. Uh, like a lot of the fir has a bicolor underside on the needle with white banding. The cones are purple which is also attractive probably gets around 20 to 25 foot tall and maybe about uh, 12 foot wide maybe 15 foot wide and uh, doesn't get quite as large so just some other trees if you're looking for some evergreens to diversify in the landscape uh, give the the fir family a consideration you know it's amazing how many choices you have when it comes to a simple fir tree once again, we really appreciate Todd's help in producing the feature. For more information on plant selections, take a few minutes after the show to visit the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. We've been uploading our features and programs for several years. It's a great resource to help you grow plants the right way and pick out beautiful ornamentals for your home and all sorts of other good information. Check it out after the show. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. All right, Wayne, one picture. Oh, announcements, sorry. I am not on my game tonight. This is the Garden Club of Lincoln Plant Sale, Saturday the 13th from 10 to 1 at the Food Fort, which is Southern Heights Presbyterian Church. And we have one more, which is the free composting demonstration by Nebraska Extension Master Gardeners, Saturday, May 20th at Pioneers Park. So a couple fun things also in the gardening world. All right, now, Wayne. Are you sure? No, All but right. we're going to give you a question. <laughs> so this is, this is a neat one. This is one picture. Uh, he, it's a farm in Saline County. You can see the little, the little black thing in there. This hive showed up recently in the past year. It's 12 by 12. Is this a honeybee hive or something else? Well, it's probably not actually a hive. It's, we'll call it a bee ball since we're on balls tonight. And in the middle of that will be a queen bee, at least one, that has left the original colony and taken a, a number of workers with her. So they are looking for another cavity to set up shop in and start a new colony in. Neat, all right, uh, two pictures on this one. And this uh, was in Norfolk at the end of September. They were thick on her marigolds and she just wants to know what they were. And we love to have people send us pics from last year. Yeah, so this one, I actually went through the effort to ID this one out. You can see enough of the yellow and black structure of the hairs and everything on it. I believe this is a Southern Plains bumblebee. And yes, they do get a, a, as far up as South Dakota, so it's not unusual to see them up in Norfolk. All right, It's excellent. likely a queen. 
Like Bee Queen, very nice. All right, uh, Dennis, this is uh, found outside a cemetery in Haddam, Kansas. He says not many people know what this is. He was told by a friend it's a pack rat nest, and, and uh, is that what it is? And he was told not to park any farm equipment by it because it would damage the vehicle. Well, yes, it is a pack rat nest, and there's several, of, we have several in the south east corner of Nebraska. And I'm about, I've never seen pack rats, you know, get on a tractor and go joyriding, so I wouldn't <laughs> worry about it. They will get into the, the fabric if you have cushionings, that's all. Okay, pack rat news. Hmm. Okay, so two picks on this one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. Bat house uh, was empty and they finally have inhabitants and now they have a lot of them. The house, they don't want them on the patio. She's wondering, can she move the bat house now with the bats in it? Uh, not a good thing. You'll probably, they'll probably leave and they may come back and they may not. All right, and then yeah. sort of the follow up on that also is she's wondering, can she put something under the bat house if she doesn't move it to catch the guano? And then does she need to wear gloves to clean it up? It'd be better, I mean, in the soil, guano is a great fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So if it's dropping on soil, that's good. If it's dropping on the patio, if you could just wash it off the patio every morning, that, that'd be sufficient. All right. You don't need to collect it because then you'll be concentrating it. Just wash it off. Okay. Uh, one more question, and this is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, apparently her cat is using this peach as a scratching post. Any way to keep the cat from doing that? Well, if you still want to keep the cat and not have it do it, use some drain tile or some protection that is about an inch wider, inch wider diameter and put it around the tree so the cat hits the plastic drain tile, like four inch drain tile, cut a slit in it, and it'll work. All right, excellent, thank you. Okay, Lauren, uh, two pictures on this first one. This is a Lincoln viewer. So last fall, we addressed a problem with lilacs where the leaves got spotted, turned brown, curled up. We advised a fungicide in the spring. What type of fungicide and how early? Yeah, so a couple things on this. With all the, the, the dry leaves in this picture, I think a lot of this is due to powdery mildew, actually. Kim, and we see that very common late in the season. So you can use uh, sulfur-based fungicides to help with that, although um, it's going to be hard to manage. All it's right, really hard. two more uh, pictures, and this is also a lilac. This is a Gretna viewer. Any idea why the leaves are like this? Yeah, cupping and curved leaves, um, a lot of times some sort of a, a growth regulator herbicide drift it would be the thought here, and it's all newer growth. Uh, the black tips, uh, I think in one of the notes they mentioned covering it, I think it may have frosted on the edge, and then you've got growth regulator herbicide drift. All right, uh, one, two more here. This is a witch's broom in Wygelia, and uh, is wondering, is, can, what do we do here? Well, witch's brooms, you know, if, if this is truly a systemic infection, um, you know, and I, I would let it grow for a little bit and watch it, but if you decide to replace it, you can just, just take that out. If you cut it, it's going to grow back as well. So a new plant can be planted back in the same area. All right, and John, end of the line, and we have, we have one minute, two pictures. This is an Omaha viewer wonders whether they should be pruning the knockout roses. Well, you know, that knockout rose looks like it might be a a goner. I mean, it could still be coming out from, from the winter. Uh, so give it a little bit more time, but if you don't see leaves on it soon, you know, you'd probably just want to prune that out. I see some growth from the base. From my knowledge, most knockout roses are on their own roots. They aren't grafted, so that should still be the knockout. Uh, so you could also see what comes up and, and leave that in place as well. Just prune out whatever's dead. All right, and uh, this is a Northwest Hall County that has all these roses in it. They wonder how to kill them. Yeah, so we have, you know, sort of a wild rose here. I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Um, the, you could use a, a, an herbicide with 2,4-D, uh, or you can do mowing throughout the season. Uh, you know, if you can mow it down a few times to weaken it, and then in the fall do a treatment with a 2,4-D or a dicamba, or you can find a product with 2,4-D and triclopyr, which would probably be the most successful. All right, thank you, John.